said that, I was serious when I say we're just going to have to get going and buckle up and see what we can cover tonight, because we're going to be looking at a lot of verses, and um, so maybe if you have a pen and paper, you'll just want to write some verses down and just look at this a little bit later on when we're done. Um, let's begin then by, by asking the Lord uh, for help tonight, okay? Our gracious God and Father, we're thankful for all the studies we've enjoyed this week, and we realize that this week didn't just begin this week, that the time that all of us have spent in your word, whether speaking or just fellowshipping, whatever it is that we're doing here at this conference this week, and it didn't just start today. Father, you, through your word, worked in our heart, and you brought us to the place where we understood our lost and condemned condition, and that the Lord Jesus Christ alone himself was our only answer, and that your word conveyed that to us, and by simple faith, as a helpless, lost, condemned sinner, we just said, Lord, I, I need the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, as, as, uh, as Marvin just sang here, we're, we're glad we got converted, and we pray, Father, that the things that we study this evening, that they would excite our heart, that they would help us to see with a little more clarity the outcome that you see and you tell us about in your word. And regardless of how dark the days get sometimes, regardless of how it just seems like the adversary is con continuing to win at every crossroads, if the game's not over yet, the bell hasn't rung, the final buzzer hasn't sounded, and indeed, in the end, the Lord Jesus Christ will be exalted as King of kings and Lord of lords over this earth and the preeminent one in the heavenly places. And we'll thank you for that wonderful truth. In Christ's precious name, we give thee praise and honor. Amen. My topic tonight is the coming Armageddon. And I, as I was mentioning a few moments ago, I even said to Brother Jordan uh, earlier today that, that, boy, as I was studying this information, it, it, it's just so much information and it can be quite overwhelming. So I thought what I would do is I would start off to give you the short version and then ask you if you want the long version. The short version is this. The greatest battle in human history is coming. It's going to be against Jesus Christ and the Antichrist. Jesus is going to win. We're done. That's the short version. Okay? So, should we pray and go home or should we get, get the long version? <laughs> well, what should we do? Let's get the long version. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> You know, but, but really, that's, that's the end of the story. That, that's what's going to happen, is that we live in a day, I, I'm going to ask you to open up, if you would, to uh, Romans chapter uh, 12 over here. Go to Romans chapter number 12. We, we still live in the dispensation of grace, and thus heaven is still saying to earth, be ye reconciled to God, right? That is still the message today. God absolutely is not yet pouring out His wrath upon this earth, and as long as the body of Christ is on this earth, we are still ambassadors at a time when God is saying grace and peace. But of course, there will be a time when God will call the church the body of Christ home and in, in doing so is going to end the dispensation of grace. And then the message from heaven earth to earth is going to be different. It's going to be back to the prophecy program, which we have been studying all week. And if you look over to Romans chapter number 12 here, there's a passage that the Apostle Paul says here, and it's down in verse 19, there's a phrase I'm looking for. Uh, 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 Romans 12, 19, he says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written. And here's what I want you to see. He says, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. As we look around the world, we see in, uh, injustice, we see unrighteousness abound. Everywhere you look, it seems like truth is said to be evil, evil is said to be truth, righteousness is, is abased, unrighteousness abounds. Everywhere you look, it seems like evil goes on and abounds and it waxes worse and worse. And you really can at times begin to wonder, will the scene ever change? Well, as Bible believers, we know something. We know the answer to that question. And it's contained right there in that verse. God says this. He says, vengeance is mine I will repay. He says, just trust me. Trust me that I know what I'm doing. Trust me that my word will come to pass exactly like it said it will come to pass. So when the days get dark and it seems like it might be hopeless, it seems like there's just no way out of this mess, 
Go back to that verse and say, Lord, I'm just going to trust you that you will set things right. And I can rest in that. Now, as we get started then tonight to look at this issue of the coming Armageddon, I've got some observations, some general observations that I want to, to make first that will kind of give us big picture type of stuff. And then we're going to get down into uh, some of the nitty gritty. We, we won't be able to look at a lot of it just because, again, there's much, much, there's way too much information. And that is observation number one. Observation number one is that when you study about the coming Armageddon, there's just, a, there's so much information and there's no way that we can cover it in one session, so I'm not going to attempt to. Rather, what I'm going to attempt to do is kind of cover and look at some big picture type of stuff from three perspectives. Number one, the perspective is going to be looking at the Antichrist and the armies that he gathers together, the Gentile nations that he gathers together for the express purpose of not only seeking to annihilate Israel off the face of the planet, but actually to go and destroy specifically Jerusalem and claim that territory. He wants to claim it once and for all for his own. The second thing that we're going to look at is we're going to look at a few verses about the believing remnant in history at that time, the Jewish remnant that believes that Jesus is the Christ. Remember the message last night from Brother Alex, how there's going to be that competing message. The believing remnant out of the nation of Israel that believes that Jesus of Nazareth was the Christ. They're going to be trusting him, but pretty much everyone else out of the nation of Israel is going to be pointing to this other person that they think is the Christ. And so at the time we're going to be looking at, there's going to be this faithful remnant on the earth, and you think it's looking bad today in the dispensation of grace? Their situation is going to be worse than it was when they were coming out of Egypt in a predicament where they were stuck in the wilderness, surrounded on all four sides, and apparently nowhere to go. It's going to be worse than that. So we're going to look at some things about what they're going to be saying and crying uh, out there uh, to the Lord in, in that day. And then the third thing that we're going to look at, we're going to, we're going to try to look at all these kind of together. Um, that'll be interesting. But uh, the third thing we're going to look at is, is, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ, who initially, when we're starting the specifics here, the Lord Jesus Christ is actually in heaven. And then the Father's going to tell him to do something, and then he's going to begin. And he's going to come down, and he's going to take care of business. So that's kind of the, some of the specifics that we're going to try to look at. Now, something else we're saying, looking at as far as general comments. When we talk about the phrase, the day of the Lord, there'll be several passages that we see tonight where you see the phrase, the day of the Lord. We tend to think of the day of the Lord up on the chart here. I'm not sure if everybody can see that, but up on the chart here, see it right there, uh, the 70th week of Daniel. We generally, sometimes people refer to as it, it, it as the tribulation period, that kind of thing, which is a little loose use of that term. But we tend to think of the phrase, the day of the Lord, just as that seven-year period. There are a lot of phrases that the Old Testament uses, and by the way, in the New Testament, use with reference to what we generally think about the day of the Lord. Some of the phrases are the day of the Lord. Another one, the day of his fierce anger. Another one, the great and terrible day of the Lord. Another one, the great and notable day of the Lord. Another one, the day of vengeance. Another one, the great day of God Almighty. So there's several terms that really, they're not identical they are somewhat often interchangeable. So let me say it this way. Technically speaking, the day of the Lord actually historically began with the Babylonian servitude. The day of the Lord technically historically began when God gave his nation over to Nebuchadnezzar. That's actually when it began. And it's going to carry all the way through the millennial reign of Christ. It's all the day of the Lord. But specifically what we're looking at tonight and the passage that we are looking at, passages that we're going to be looking at tonight are, are not going to so much take us back to Babylon and not going to go out into the millennial reign of Christ. I think Rick, I think he's doing that message tomorrow night. We're going to be focusing on that aspect of the day of the Lord that does indeed focus on the 70th week of Daniel and in particular, right at the end of the 70th week of Daniel. So you're going to see some of the passages that we read that are going to say the day of the Lord. And in the context, even though prophetically some things happened in the past, you're going to see in the context where that, where that verse, what it's speaking about, 
He's really talking about at the end of the 70th week of Daniel. So again, what we're going to be focusing on in terms of the day of the Lord is that aspect of the day of the Lord that focuses out here in the end of the 70th week of Daniel. Okay, so those are some uh, uh, preliminary comments just to kind of set the table where we're at tonight. So take a deep breath, okay, everybody, <laughs> all right, and then, let's, uh, and then let's get going. All right, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to the book of Revelation, and we're going to go to uh, Revelation chapter number 16. I'm going to have you get Revelation chapter 16, but I also want you to get Isaiah chapter 61. I want you to get Isaiah 61, Isaiah chapter 61, and then you're going to get Revelation and chapter number 16, if you would. Isaiah chapter six, uh, Isaiah 61, and then Revelation chapter 16. What I'll try to do each time is at least repeat the verse a couple of times so that you at least can write the verse down, okay? Okay, now you'll recall uh, here in Isaiah chapter 61 that when the Lord Jesus Christ was here on this earth during his, his ministry as recorded in the Gospels, he goes to his synagogue where he was raised and they give him the book of Isaiah and he begins to read in this particular passage here. You'll, you'll remember this in Luke chapter 4 is where it's recorded. Verse 1, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the book and hearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and, to, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. And then it says it's to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now stop there because that's where he stopped at his first coming, right? And he closed the book. Now look at the next phrase. It says this. It says, and the day of vengeance of our God. That's what we're dealing with tonight. We're going to be looking at the day of vengeance. That phrase right there, the Lord Jesus Christ did not say at that time the day of vengeance was fulfilled because it wasn't fulfilled at his first coming. The day of vengeance is going to be fulfilled at his second coming. And so when we're talking about the, the coming Armageddon, what we're talking about is the arrival of the day of vengeance of our God, okay? So again, if you put that together with the passage in Romans, the Apostle Paul says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. The day has arrived. When we're here now, you can go over to Revelation chapter number 16. When you're in Revelation chapter number 16, think through now where you are at this point in the book of Revelation. Back in Revelation chapter 5, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb that was slain, has stood up to the, with the Father, and the Father has given Him the book that has the seals. And beginning in chapter number 6, the Lord Jesus Christ begins to break the seals. The Lord Jesus Christ from heaven is the one who orchestrates the, orchestrates the entire tribulation, the, the entire 70 week of, 70th week of Daniel. He's up in heaven. He's orchestrating this thing. And he initiates it by the breaking of the seals. By the time you're in chapter 16, you've got the seals that you've gone through. You've got the trumpets that you've gone through. And now when you come to chapter number 16, in, in fact, chapter 15, if you would, notice chapter 15, where are you at? Look at verse 1. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having... Okay, where are you now? Where are you? What's it say there? 15.1? You're at the seven last plagues. That's where you're at. You're not at the beginning of this thing anymore. You're, this thing has been building and building and building and building. And God has been giving signs and wonders and all kinds of things from heaven to, to convince men on the earth to repent, and they refuse to repent. There's an absolute hardness of heart more intense than the hardening of Pharaoh's heart in Egypt. And at this point, you're down to the, as it says there, the seven last plagues. Look at the next phrase, very significant. For in them is what? For it is filled up the wrath of God. That's why I say you're, you're at the end of this thing. When the wrath of God that has been building up and building up and building up ever since the fall of Adam all the way through human history, that wrath of God has been building and building and building and it is ready to be dealt with. And if you'll jump ahead to chapter number 16 now, look at what he says. Chapter 16, verse 1, And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your way and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. Listen, even if you don't know what these are, you don't want them. Everybody got that? Even if you, know, if, even if you can't figure out whatever, and these passages tell you what they are, 
but you know absolutely sure this is not what you want to partake, uh, partake in, okay? Something else I want you to get in mind, it, hold, hold that verse, come back with me to Revelation in chapter uh, number 6 here, come back to chapter number 6, come back to chapter 6. When the Lord Jesus Christ opens the fifth seal, you actually get a glimpse of, of heaven, and you get a glimpse of some martyrs, some people that have been executed uh, uh, for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're up in heaven, and they ask a question of the Lord. Look at uh, um, Revelation 6 and verse 10. It says, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? They ask that question from up in heaven. They've been martyred. They know their fellow believers are still on the earth, and they're asking, Lord, how much longer until you return and take that back which is your own? If you'll quickly go to chapter number 10, watch what happens in chapter number 10, if you would. Go over to chapter number 10. I'm going to start at verse 1. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, 10-1, uh, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open. That's interesting. So most of the, most of the book, the, the book that he got in chapter number 6, it was big. By chapter 10, it's small now. There's not a whole lot left that has to be fulfilled. You got the picture there? So he's got this little book here now. And what he does, if, if you look at verse 5, he says, The angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up, lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are and the earth and the, and the things that therein are and the sea and the things which are therein, that there what should be what? That, that doesn't mean he, 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 he ceases, that doesn't mean the dimension of time ceases to exist. He's answering the question back in chapter 6, How long, O Lord? And the Lord is saying, Now I'm going back. When that says, no delay any longer is the idea on that verse, that there should be time no longer. You see that there? Well, come with, with me back to chapter number 16. Go back to chapter number 16. And so you can see in chapter number 16, you're right. You, you're at the seven, uh, you, you're at the last vials where the wrath of God's going to be poured out. You can see, uh, again, at 16 verse 1, it says, I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your way and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And you can see verse 2, the first vial, verse 3, the second, verse 4, the third, and so on. I want you to jump just for time's sake down to, to verse 12. Uh, for time's sake, just jump down to verse 12 now. Here's where the issue of Armageddon is identified, and here's where it's taken from. So look at, verse, uh, look at verse 12. The sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Notice there's a preparation that God makes to allow the kings of the east to assemble. And I, watch this now. I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. What did you just see there? Who's the dragon? That's Satan. Who's the beast? That's the Antichrist. And then you've got the, you've got the unholy trinity right in that verse. You've got the united unholy Godhead right in that verse. And they're the ones that are assembling the nations together. Look at what it says. It says at verse 14, For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to do this, to gather them to the battle of that what? And there, that great day of God Almighty. We're, listen, we're, we're, you're right towards the end of that tribulation period. You're not at the beginning. You're right at the end of that seven week of Daniel, right to the close of the end of it, okay? And you can see that, that, that this word goes out. The call goes out by the ungodly, unholy Godhead for the nations that are under the, the control of the Antichrist to gather together. And if you'll look at verse 15, it says, And behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches. See, is it, that, that's put in there for the benefit of the believing remnant there. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Now watch what happens. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue. What's it say there? Now you know what's rather interesting. If you look at the word Armageddon, there really is a lot of debate of what that word actually means. It's really kind of interesting. But one thing that you will find, 
whether it's religion, religious people or secular people, all of them associate the word Armageddon with something you probably don't want to be involved in. It's incredible. You have, you have, e even atheists will use the word Armageddon to mean some kind of doomsday kind of a thing. So, when you, you, so regardless of all the debate about what our Armageddon means or actually where it is and so forth, uh, what you can see happening here is that Satan, the, the dragon, the Antichrist, and the false prophet, they send out the call. The Spirit goes out to assemble the nations that are in alignment with him to this place called Armageddon. All right, so keep that in mind. So what happens is this. Armageddon is not the physical place where the battle actually takes place. Rather, Armageddon is the place where they're assembling in preparation for the last great battles. There are going to be a number of different battles that the Lord Jesus Christ enjoins, and he's going to win all of them. Armageddon, it's like, it's like Satan is, realizes that his time is right at the end. So what, he, it's like he's gathering the nations together that are aligned with him. This one last great final battle from Armageddon, he's going to move down and eventually he wants to get and, and take Jerusalem and claim Jerusalem as his own. It's interesting when you study the idea, and I don't want to get too far off track here, but when you study the idea of Babylon, when you get a chance, go read all the things that they say about Babylon. They say, what city is like this city? Babylon is, is known as, as the queen of the cities, but she's also said to be the hammer of the whole earth under the control of Satan and so forth. But Babylon is, is the city that they compare everything to. What city is like this? And what they want to do, they want to, Antichrist wants to go and take Jerusalem and claim Jerusalem as his own because he understands that Jerusalem is said to be the city of the great king. So if he takes Jerusalem, then he can claim to be the great king. You see, you see what's going on there? The Bible, you, you have, how many of y'all read, read the book called A Tale of Two Cities? You realize the two cities in the Bible are Jerusalem and Babylon. That's the real tale of the two cities, okay? Anyway, so what you can see here is, is Satan and the Antichrist and the false prophet, they've sent their spirit out controlling these nations. They've gathered them together at, at Armageddon here for the purpose of marching their armies down for, because they want to conquer and defeat uh, Israel and Jerusalem. Now, some other things are going on, however. Remember, at this point, the remnant is on the earth. They're being persecuted. They're having to flee to various spots. The Lord Jesus Christ is in heaven or orchestrating all this. What I want you to do now is shift gears a little bit. Go with me to the book of Job, chapter, uh, Joel, I'm sorry, Joel in chapter number three. Go to Joel in chapter number three. Go to the book of Joel, chapter number three. Watch this now. Joel chapter number 3, and I want you to also get Job chapter 41. Joel chapter 3, and get the book of Job in chapter 41. I want you to see what's happening here. Remember I said that the Lord Jesus Christ is the one from heaven who is orchestrating this, right? Satan thinks that he is in utter control of everything that is happening. Uh, you should have Job chapter 41, Job chapter 41, and then I want you to have Joel chapter number 3. A question that God asks Job in Job chapter 41 about, about Leviathan. He says this. He says, Job chapter 41, he says this. Canst thou draw out Leviathan with a hook or his tongue with the cord which thou lettest down? Canst thou put a hook in his nose? Okay, I got a question for you. How many of you guys here like to fish? I saw one lady's hand go up. <laughs> How many of you guys like to fish? Guys or girls, you guys like to fish at all? What, what's he describing there? The, the Lord from heaven, he, he's letting down a hook. He's enticing Leviathan. He's enticing Satan to the battle. Satan thinks that he's controlling everything. But you can let go of that passage. Go to Joel chapter number 3 here. Watch what this passage says. Look over to the book of Joel chapter number 3. He says this, For behold... In those days and in that time when I shall bring again the captivity uh, 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 of Judah and Jerusalem. Look at verse 2 now. I will, gather also, I will also gather all nations and bring them down where? Where does it say there? Into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. God says through the prophet Joel here, you know what? 
I'm the one inviting them to the battle. In fact, if you look over to verse number 9, watch what it says here through the prophet Joel. In verse number 9, he says this, Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. What are the next two words there? What's the message of God to the Gentiles at the time when these verses are coming to pass? You know what it is? It's prepare war. What's the message of God today in the dispensation of grace? How about grace and peace? Aren't you glad you live in the dispensation of grace? Heaven is going to declare to the earth. It's going to declare to the Gentiles here that are aligned with the Antichrist. He's going to say, okay, guys, you've been fighting against me all this time. You've been seeking to, to impose your pride and your arrogancy on me and take my land, destroy my people. And he says, okay, I'm ready to join you now in the battle. And he invites them to the battle. So the Antichrist, by the power of Satan, has assembled the Gentile nations together at Armageddon, and then they begin to march. They begin to march. And the whole massive band of them heads down to the valley of Jehoshaphat on, on their way to go and conquer Jerusalem. You see what's happening here? At this point, the Lord is still in heaven. He's still orchestrating this whole thing. Now think about, if you were the believing remnant at this time, what might you be thinking? Well, might you be a little concerned? You, 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 the Antichrist with his powerful armies, they're coming against you. And you can see at this verse that the Lord himself says at verse 2, I will also gather all nations and bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there. I want you to go to verse 9 now. Go back to verse 9 of the same chapter. Joel chapter number 3 and uh, verse 9. He says, proclaim ye this among the Gentiles, prepare war. Look, look at God. God just throws down the gauntlet here. He says, wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. By the way, keep that concept, that phrase in mind, men of war, man of war. Keep that in mind, would you? He says, prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. That same statement was said many, many years ago, almost 2,000 years ago, by the Lord Jesus Christ when he was on the cross. And he was taunted there by Satan while he, Christ, was on the cross. He says, where is mine adversary? Let us stand together. Let him come up. And he faced the Lord Jesus Christ. Satan faced the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. There's another, there's another face-off that's going to happen right here. When the Lord Jesus Christ sends out the call for the nations, then he says, mine adversaries, let them come and engage me again. Let's see how this battle turns out. He tells them this at verse 10, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. What, what's happening there? That, that's the opposite of disarmament. That's exactly the opposite of what Isaiah chapter number 2 says the kingdom's going to be like. In Isaiah chapter number 2, he says the kingdom, they're going to take their, their armament and make it turn it back to plowshares. They're not going to learn more anymore. The Lord tells the nation, all the nations, all the things you've ever learned about combat, you get ready to employ them against me now. And, and, and he says, beat your plowshares into swords, your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say I am strong. You've been saying all along? You get your chance now. Assemble yourselves and uh, uh, assemble yourselves and come all ye heathen and, and gather yourselves together round about thither. Now watch what watch, watch what Joel says to God. Thither. You know, that means there, right? <laughs> At that place, cause thy mighty ones to come down. Who? Oh Lord. That's the return of the Lord Jesus Christ as the Lord of Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts when he's going to return from heaven with his mighty ones coming down to engage the enemy. See what's going on there? Isn't that amazing? He says at verse uh, 12, let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. He says, put ye in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Come get you down for the press is full the fats overflow for their wickedness is great. You know, I want you to look at something real quick, if you would. And this is not a detour. This is, I'm doing this on purpose. Go to Genesis 15. Think about this idea right there. Think about what that verse just said. Go to Genesis chapter number uh, uh, 15. 
Way back in Genesis 15, when God told Abraham that this, his seed was going to go down and be in per, uh, under persecution of the nation that was not their own, and that they would come out after a certain number of years, 400 years, there's an interesting phrase he says back here that you don't really know what he's talking about quite yet. But look at the phrase he says here. There's a phrase I want you to see. At, at Genesis 15, 16, he says this. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is what? Not yet full. There's something about the filling up of not just the iniquity of the Amorites, but the iniquity of all the nations that rebel against God. And when you're in Job chapter number 3, God through the prophet Joel, through the prophet Joel right here says, go back to chapter 3 of Joel and verse 13. He says, for the press is full, the fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. It's finally reached the fullest capacity that he will ever let it go to. And he's ready to come back and destroy them. Go with me if you would now to Isaiah 64. We're going to take kind of shift gears here a little bit. And, and so we see that, that, that Satan and, and his armies assembled at, at Armageddon. And they're beginning to move as a massive army down to where they want to get Jerusalem. But it's actually the Lord Jesus Christ who's, who's bringing them towards that direction. And he's got them in the valley of decision. What will come, Please remind me to come back to Joel here in a little bit, okay? But I want you to do is this. I want you to go to Isaiah chapter 64. Do, do put a marker there in Joel, okay? Go to Isaiah 64. Isaiah 64. Now, on, on the earth, the remnant, obviously, they're going to be somewhat concerned. Maybe somewhat, is that a light way to say it, okay? But they're going to be kind of concerned about this. Go to, uh, go to, I want Isaiah 64. Here, I'm in Psalm 64. That's why it's not making sense. Look, look at Isaiah chapter 64. Think with me about a couple of things here. Uh, several years ago, when uh, at this conference here, I preached a message about the heavens, and we talked about the nature of the heavens and when you look at what the Bible says about the heavens, the Bible tells us the concept of how God actually created the heavens. It says that first it says he spread the heavens, and then it says he stretched the heavens. Imagine you go to the store where you buy some new linens or curtains, that type of thing. You take them out of the package, you spread them out, and then you stretch them. You make them tight. In the book of Genesis, heaven is said, it's called the firmament. firmament. It's, it's firm. It's textured. It's like a canvas. And he says he garnished the heavens. Remember that? And so the heavens, they're, they're tight, they're taut, they're stretched just like a canvas. And, and the believers understand that from reading the Bible. They're on earth, they're being persecuted by Satan and his armies. Their lives are, I mean, they're in the balance. They've seen many of their brothers and sisters already martyred. And look at the cry that they say. Think about this. Look at I, I, Isaiah chapter 64, verse 1. Look at what they say. Oh, Lord. I'm, I'm sorry, oh, that thou wouldest what? Rend the heavens. That thou wouldest come down. They know the Lord is still in heaven. hasn't come down yet. And they're asking the Lord, Lord, do what you said you're going to do. Take and ride that horse and split the heavens with your return. So often the Bible talks about when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, that not only the earth is going to shake, the heavens are going to shake. Why? Because his speed coming back to this earth, him entering into the atmosphere, into, the, into these dimensions and so forth, is going to be with such force, it's going to rip the heavens and it's going to truly send a shockwave across the texture of the heavens, the solar system, and including this earth. When you look at the details about how the Bible describes the very topography on the earth is going to be radically changed. Every mountain shall be made low. Every valley shall be made, whole, made high. And this gigantic earthquake never happened. Some massive changes in the heavens, the stars of heaven, all the descriptions you see in the Bible. Listen, it's all coming together right here at this time. And when they cry out, they say, Oh, that thou wouldest rend, uh, rend the heavens, that thou wouldest come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. As when the melting fire burneth, the fire causeth the waters to boil, to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at what? At thy presence. You see what's going on there? The believer remnant on the earth is asking the Lord, Lord, come and do what you said, so the nations know that you are God. Well, I want you to go to Zechariah chapter 14 now. I want you to go to Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah and chapter number 14. Look over to Zechariah chapter 14. Watch what happens here. 
Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah chapter number 14, watch verse 1. Zechariah 14, verse 1. Look at this. Zechariah 14, verse 1. He says, he says this. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. Watch this now. For I will gather all nations against where? See, see what it, they've gone from the area called Armageddon. Then they come down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, the valley of decision. Now they're completely surrounded Jerusalem. You see the movement of the armies here? He, he says, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. Now watch the situation. The city shall be taken. Some of you might remember seeing some of the scenes of World War II when the bombing raids that, that uh, Germany uh, did over, over Europe. Just utter devastation across the cities. And, and when the Germans bombed Russia, and then, of course, when Germany got bombed, there was just utter devastation. Well, multiply that like tenfold, and you're going to see that's the condition in Jerusalem. Just utter devastation all over. The city shall, it says, the city shall be taken. The houses rifled, and the women what? Just absolute no consideration for, for the women at all. That means you don't care about their person of any kind. It says, and half the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Question, if you were an Israelite, a believer in that city, what does it look like your predicament is? What's that? Doom. doom. Utter doom. The Lord Jesus Christ on purpose is going to allow Israel, those that are still in Jerusalem at this time, He's going to, on purpose, allow them to be in a situation similar to like what they were when they came out of Egypt. Remember when they came out of Egypt, they were surrounded on all sides. Pharaoh on, the, on one side, the Red Sea on the other, the wilderness and then the desert. On, they, there was no way to go. And God says, stand still through Moses. says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. God, on purpose, once again, is going to allow the nation of Israel, still physic, those that are still here in Jerusalem, because many will have fled by this point, all right? He's going to allow them in Jerusalem to be in a situation worse even than that. What is the first word of verse 3? First word. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. That as when he fought, he takes you right back to Exodus, right back to when he beat Egypt and so forth. But I want you to see, that that's on earth. I want you to see what's happening in heaven. If you'll remember, when the Lord Jesus Christ, after his resurrection, he ascends to the Father's right hand. And of course, the Father says, fulfilling Psalms 110, verse 1, he says, the Lord said to my Lord, David said, I prophesied this, the Lord said to my Lord, what? Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. See that? Here, in Zechariah 14, Jerusalem is surrounded. The city's like in waste and so forth. Israel's doomed. No hope. And now watch what happens. I want you to go with me, uh, if you would, over to Psalms 45. Go to Psalms 45. Do you have enough fingers so far to hold all these verses? <laughs> go to Psalms 45. Watch, watch what happens. This is a wonderful psalm here. Go to Psalms chapter 45. Go to Psalms and chapter number 45. Watch, watch this. This is, this is pretty cool. And then you're, you're going to get Revelation 19. We'll, we'll take this one step at a time, okay? Psalms 45, watch what, watch what the Father says. He says this, My heart is indicting a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. My, my tongue is the pen of a ready writer. By the way, I, I have to side note on that for just a second. I got, I, got a, I got a rabbit trail on that. You see that last phrase there? That last phrase there, my tongue is the pen of, the ready, of a ready writer, that's one of the greatest verses in all the Bible about the doctrine of inspiration. My tongue is the pen of a writer. That verse talks about the Bible, where it came from and what it is and why God's going to keep it. My tongue is the pen of what I told the guy to write. When you read what the guy wrote, that's what I said. Oh, back on track now. Look at that verse. He says, my heart is indicting a good matter. I speak of the things 
which I have made touching the king. When God thinks about the things in this context relative to, his, to, to the king and so forth, he says, this is a good matter that my, my heart is indicting, my heart is committed to and thinking about it. This is a good matter. Let's see what the matter is. He says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to jump ahead to verse 3. Look what the father says to the son. Gird thy sword upon thy thigh, O most mighty, with thy glory and thy majesty, and in thy majesty do what? What's it say there? Ride prosperously because of truth and meekness and righteousness, and thy right hand shall teach thee terrible things. You see the good matter that the heart of God is indicting? The good matter is he's going to tell the Lord, listen, I, you were to sit at my right hand until it was time for me to tell you to, to gird your sword upon your side and then mount that white charger and ride prosperously because of righteousness and truth and holiness. This is when the Father, this is when that verse is actually literally going to be fulfilled. And Jesus Christ is going to, the heavens are going to, he's going to break through the heavens. He's going to come back fulfilling this passage. Look at what it says at verse, uh, verse 5. Thine arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, whereby the people fall under thee. And then look at the end result. Verse 6. What is it? Thy throne, O God. Is for, it's, it's thy throne. It's not Satan's throne. It's not man's throne. It's thy throne. O God is forever and ever. The scepter, of righteous, the scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore God, thy God, has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. The world tried to anoint a different king, the Antichrist. God's going to anoint his king and make him king of kings and lord of lords. I want you to go to Revelation 19. You can let go of that passage. Go to Revelation 19. You're all familiar with this passage here. Revelation chapter number 19. Put, these pictures, put this all together. Let, let, let the Word of God paint the picture for you. Let the Word of God create the movie. You don't need to go to Hollywood to see this movie. Look in the Word of God and it'll give you the greatest picture, the greatest movie because this one's real. Look at Revelation chapter number 19. Watch this. At this point, the Lord Jesus Christ has indeed, in Revelation 19, when this happens, he stood up, he's, he, he's girded his sword upon his side, he's mounted that white charger, and here he comes riding. Look at Revelation 19, and I saw heaven, what? What's it say there? By the way, in the Bible, when people are on earth and they see heaven opened, usually it's not a good thing. <laughs> Okay, sometimes it is. Okay, Jacob looks up and sees heaven. But listen, <laughs> anyway, he says, I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called what and what? See, and notice it's capital, titles, faithful and true and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. Remember the first time he came? It, 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 Song of Solomon talked, I think it's Song of Solomon. It says his eyes were like dove's eyes, eyes of compassion. He's got something different in his eyes at this point. His eyes were as a flame of fire, right? It says, his eyes were as a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but himself. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called, who? What's his name called? The Word of God. The Word of God. You can't help but think of John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was what? The Word. You see, it's always been about the Word. It's always been about God's intention for the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he comes, it says in verse 14, the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Listen, when the Lord Jesus Christ leaves heaven, you can see there, it's interesting, it says his vestures dipped in blood. It's kind of interesting. When he leaves heaven, he's, he's, he's white and clean. Man, later on when he, when he finishes the battle, he's got blood from head to toe and it's not his own. The Bible says about him when he was on the cross, it says his visage was marred more than any man. And it says, so, so shall he do to the nations. He's going to return the favor. You see that? Anyway, what I'm going to have you do is this. I want you to go now to back to Zechariah 14. Go back to Zechariah chapter 14. <clears throat> go back to Zechariah chapter number 14. <clears throat> Watch this now. Boy, my throat is just not going to last if I keep shouting. I apologize for shouting. I just get a little excited, by the way. <laughs> okay? Okay? Um, let's see. Go, go to Zechariah 14, and then you're also going to get Joel 3 once again. Look at Zechariah chapter number 14. Look at Zechariah chapter 14. Remember, when you're in Zechariah 14, 
verse 1 and 2. He's gathered the nations and they're at Jerusalem at this point. It looks like Israel is going to be utterly defeated and abandoned by God. And then verse 3, the very first word, what's it say? Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. So here he comes out of heaven, Revelation 19. He's riding that horse out of heaven. The angels of, of heaven are following him. Now watch what he's going to do, verse 4. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof towards the east and towards the west. And there shall uh, be a very great valley. And half the mountain shall, shall remove toward the north and half of it towards the south and so on. The Lord, by the way, that's where he's actually going to culminate the battle. There's a lot of battles that are going to go on prior to this point. But you can see he comes back and he rescues the remnant in Jerusalem. He saves them by this miraculous salvation if you would, go to Isaiah chapter number 34. Go to Isaiah chapter number 34. Let's get some other details here. Go to Isaiah chapter number 34. Isaiah chapter number 34. Watch this. Look at Isaiah chapter number 34. And I think I did ask you to get Joel, and I, I forgot to go back there, so we'll, we'll do that in just a second. Look over to Isaiah chapter 34. Watch, watch verse 1 now. Look at this. He says, verse 1, Come near ye nations to hear, and hearken ye people. Let the earth hear, and all that is therein, the world, and all things that come forth of it. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations, and his fury upon all their armies. See that? He, he's fed up with them at this point. This is not the dispensation of grace. This is not the long-suffering of God. I'm going I, I, to have you look at, jump to verse 4. He says, And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved. He's going he's to cleanse the heaven of the satanic rebellion out there. He says, All the host of heaven shall be dissolved. The heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. All their hosts shall fall down as a leaf falleth off from the vine, as a falling fig from the fig tree. Watch this. For my sword shall be what? What's it say there? Bathed. In, listen. He girds that sword upon his thigh, upon his side there. He mounts that charger, it, th that horse coming out of heaven. And, and he begins to wield that thing in heaven. By the time he comes down to the earth, that thing's already filled with blood. Isn't that fascinating? Think about that. He says, for my sword shall be bathed in heaven. It shall come down upon Idumea and upon the people of my curse to judgment. That's like the Edomites in that territory south of where, where Jerusalem is. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made fat with fatness and with the blood of lambs and so on. He, he, talks, about the, 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 he talks about a sacrifice down there at Basra and a great slaughter of, uh, in the land of Idumea. He's accompanied by the unicorns that are going to come down with him. Those are real creatures up around the throne room of God, by the way. Think about that, okay? And so why is all this happening? Look at verse 8. Verse 8. For it is the day of the Lord's what? Didn't the Lord over and we didn't read, we read earlier about the Lord, about the Lord when he came to announce the acceptable day of the Lord, but not yet the year of vengeance, the day of vengeance? Well, here it is. He says at that verse, for it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. There's been a long-standing controversy about Zion. It's going to be settled at this point in history, and it'll be settled forever. Um, he says, and the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch. And the dust thereof into brimstone, and the land thereof shall become burning pitch. You know what's going to happen? The Lord Jesus Christ, out of his mouth is going to go the word of God, and like a fire, it's going to set that land on fire. He says at verse 10, it shall not be quenched night nor day. Doesn't that sound like the fire? It talks about, the Lord Jesus Christ talks about that fire that shall never be quenched. That's, what that, that's what's happening right here. I want you to go back, back with me over to the book of Joel. Go back to Joel 3 now. Go back to Joel chapter 3. Go back to Joel chapter 3. Look, look what happens. Joel chapter number 3. This time we're, we're going to pick back up at verse 14. He says, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened. The stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord also, by the way, by the way, think about this. Okay, if the sun and the moon are darkened and the stars withdraw their shining, 
what's that? What's happening? You've got utter, total, complete darkness over the earth. Can you think about time in history when, when back in Israel's history, when, when God manifested the reality of darkness? It was so dark that it could be felt, the plagues of Egypt. God brought into physical manifestation the nature of the lie program. It, it's a darkness that so possesses you, it can, it's like you can feel it. Isn't that fascinating? And he, he puts the world in utter total darkness. And then he comes back. Remember the Lord Jesus Christ in the Gospels, he says that the, the coming of the Son of Man is going to be like lightning shining from one end of heaven to the other. My voice is going really fast. I apologize for that. That's what's going to happen right there. The, the world's going to be in utter total darkness. And then this, this, this massive lightning is going to be the Lord Jesus Christ returning to this earth for the victory of his people. He says at verse, uh, uh, verse 16, The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and the earth shall shake but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Watch this. So, when he physically comes back and demonstrates his capacity to defeat the enemy, so shall you know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall no more strangers pass through her anymore. You know what's going to take for this world to believe? that Jesus Christ is the rightful creator and owner of this earth and king of, this, of Jerusalem, it's going to take his physical return to this earth as the king of kings and lord of lords, engaging the enemy as the man of war. Amen. And he's going to demonstrate his capacity to engage in the battle as one who is worthy of that title, the man of war. If it, I want you to do this now. I want you to go over to, to chapter number 30 of Isaiah. Go to Isaiah chapter number 30. Isaiah chapter number 30 here. All right, we're about one-third done. Uh, no, I'm, 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 I'm joking there. We're, we're, we're moving along here. Okay, look over to Isaiah chapter number 30 here. Watch this. Look over to Isaiah chapter number 30. Isaiah chapter number 30 here. And I want you to look at verse 30. It says, And the Lord shall cause his glorious voice to be heard, and shall show the lighting down of his arm, with the indignation of his anger and with the flame of a devouring fire, with scattering and tempest and hailstones. For through the voice of the Lord shall the Assyrian be beaten down, which smote with a rod. Watch this now, verse 32. Look at the, think about the description, the details were told here, verse 32. And in every place where the grounded staff shall pass which the Lord shall lay upon him, it shall be with what and what? Wait a minute, that's kind of weird. Wait, wait a minute. Because doesn't, doesn't, when you read verse 32, you've got the Lord, he, he's going to be defeating the adversary and his armies every place he engages them. That, that grounded staff, boom, he's going to say, this is my territory now. And he's going to follow him to the next. He's going to ground the staff, this is my territory now. And he's going to engage in multiple battles. And every place where he does that, it says, what's it say there? It shall be with what? Tabrets and harps. What's happening there? That's the remnant cheering his victory. You see that there? Every place that the Lord engages the Antichrist and his armies, and, and he grounds that staff and he claims, this is my land. The believers that are in that territory are going to see it come to pass and they're going to sing songs of praise and glory with harps and trumpets shouting joy there. That's pretty, man, think about the picture he's telling us here. It says, uh, with harps, and in battles of shaking will he fight with it. For tope it is ordained of old. Yea, for the king it is prepared. He hath made it deep and large. The pile thereof is fire and much wood. Watch this, look at that. The breath of the Lord, like a stream of brimstone, does you know, the Lord. He's, you know, the Bible, when it describes the dragon over in, in, in Job, it you get the picture, he's like a fire breathing dragon. The Lord Jesus Christ, he's not a dragon, but he's breathing fire. It's the word of God coming out of his mouth. And he's going to be setting this land on fire. 
You see that there? I want you to go to Isaiah chapter number 25. Let's look at the remnant. Look at Isaiah chapter 25 here. Isaiah chapter number 25. Just go, go backwards a few passages here. Look what they say. Look, look, they've just cried out to the Lord. They've seen the Lord victory over, over in these various battles with, with, with the Antichrist. And the Lord says this. I, I'm going to jump down Isaiah chapter 20. I'm leaving so much out, but that's all right. Isaiah 25. Look at what he says in verse 6. And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a, a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the lees, of fat things full of marrow of wines on the lees, uh, uh, well refined. And he will, watch this now. And he will destroy in this mountain, look at that phrase there, the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. You know what those phrases are referenced to? That's a reference to the lie program. Sa Satan took that lie program beginning way back in the garden, yea hath God said. And that phrase, ye man, can I start this thing over? <laughs> okay, <laughs> can I at least stop it? And um, sa Satan's lie program, yea hath God said, that's how it started. And, and it's morphed into all kinds of different forms in the lie program. And that's a veil. It's a covering over people's spiritual thinking and eyes. And they're possessed by that thing. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to destroy it finally. Once and for all. The utter complete destruction of the lie program. When he takes and destroys that veil that's cast over all people, that, that, that covering cast over all people, and the veil that is spread over all nations. Uh, 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 look at verse 8. He's going to swallow up death. and He's going to even conquer victory, although that actually doesn't happen until the very end of the thousand-year reign, ultimately, right? But I want you to jump to verse 9. Watch it, verse 9. And it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God, Look at that next phrase. What's that phrase say? We have waited for him. That's the remnant there. He will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Can't you just see the heart of the faithful women? The, 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 the predicament, their situation was such that it looked like they were utterly doomed and abandoned by God and that Satan was going to win. And then here comes their Savior. Here comes the Lord to save them. He crushes the rebellion, defeats the adversary, destroys the lie program, removes the covering from the nations. And then you see the believing remnant here. This is our God. We waited for Him. Everything that we faced told us He wasn't the Messiah. The signs and miracles and wonders by the Antichrist, they, they were so powerful, they, they, they got to the point where they made us take a second look. But we made a choice to trust that Jesus of Nazareth was our Messiah. He's at the Father's right hand, and He's going to come and save us. We waited for Him, and here He is. Can't you just see the tears of joy, the tears of gratitude and thankfulness, as they see their king, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's riding to, he's coming up to them, to them in Jerusalem. Again, from head to toe, he's covered with blood. He's not his own blood. Who is this that cometh glorious in his apparel? I, the Lord, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou garments covered? He says, I engaged the battle alone. There was no man to engage it with me. And they recognize him as their Messiah, their Lord. I'm going to have you go over, uh, look over then to Zechariah 14.9. You, you guys know what Zechariah 14.9 says, right? Zechariah 14.9. <clears throat> Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9. Look at that verse. And it's not the only one of his kind. Zechariah 14.9. Look at that verse. It says this, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord, 
and his name won. See that? L l you know what? <laughs> in that day there shall be, in that day the Lord shall be king over all the earth. I'm going to have you go this time, if you would, over to Psalm 46 now. Go to Psalms 46. Let's try to wrap this up by reading, just, just reading and letting our mind absorb. Let the Spirit of Almighty God take His Word and just take it deep into our soul and our mind and heart with the things that are said here. Go to Psalms 46, if you would. Go to Psalms 46. We'll start there. Psalms 46. <clears throat> Psalms chapter 46, we're going to start at verse 1, Psalms 46, verse 1. And by the way, I want you to get Ezekiel 48 as well, okay? The last chapter in Ezekiel, this, this will be a connection that you'll want to make here. So look at Psalms 46. Look at the remnant. Look at what they say. They say, God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. That's the time of Jacob's trouble. And he's right there present with them. And they're waiting for him to physically return. Watch what they say. Therefore we will not fear. Though the earth be removed. Now that's going to happen. The earth is physically going to move. It says... Though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, that's going to happen. The topography of the earth is physically going to change. Though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. This is something big time's going on there, similar to the flood. You see the picture there? Physical things are happening to this earth. And you've got the believing remnant in peace. And they say this now. Verse 4. Say la. Verse 4 says, they remember this. They say, you know what? There's a river. The streams whereof shall make glad the city of God. The holy place of the tabernacles of the most high. What are they thinking about? Is, man, the earth is shaking like this. Volcanoes, earthquakes, mountains ri falling, valleys rising. And, and, and they're quoting that verse. Okay, listen, everything's shaking, but we're going to trust God's word. We can't. They're going to they're, they're be thinking about that city and that water that comes out to cleanse the river of life, as it were. Look at verse 5. They remember God's in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her. And that right early. The heathen raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he has made. And there's he destroyed the rebellion. He maketh wars to cease. Finally. How many of you like studying history here? You, you study history, you read history, you look at the history of all nations, and you know what the, the theme all the way through is? The way that they mark history is one war after another war after another war. After, history is about war. All the way through, it's all about war. That, that, that verse says, He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the world. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burns the chariot in, in the fire. And then God, and he says, listen, he, he tells him, just be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. See how he reminds him that? The remnant right there. So what did they do? Chapter 47. Look at what they do. Oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. For the Lord most high is terrible. He is a great king over all the earth so verse just jump ahead to verse 6 sing praises to God sing praises sing praises unto our king sing praises for God is the king of all the earth sing ye praises with understanding God reigneth over the heathen God sitteth upon the throne of his holiness chapter 48 verse 1 chapter 48 verse 1 watch this great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Where? In the city of our God. In the mountain of His holiness. 
beautiful for situation. Look at that next phrase right there. The joy of the whole earth. Is Mount Zion on the sides of the north the city of the great king? There's going to be a day when the joy of the whole earth is going to be said to be the city of the great king. Think about what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 8. He says, the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. The whole creation. Think about the Lord Jesus Christ when he came right into Jerusalem just before he was going to go to the cross. He goes to the temple and the, the Pharisees and, and priests, they said, you know, don't you hear what your disciples say? And the Lord said, listen, if, if these guys held their peace, the stones would cry out. This creation is waiting to cry that, that psalm right there. The earth, the creation is going to lift up its praise and it's going to be the joy of the whole earth. When the Lord Jesus Christ is finally, once and for all, established as the King of kings and Lord of lords over this earth that he created by simply speaking it into existence. He's going to be set up that way. You can see all the way through the section here that the believing remnant, they're just praising and praising him. and just they, Don't they have reason to praise? Reason to sing? Reason to shout? The earth, the curse has been lifted. The, the it, joy is ready to happen. You see? I want you to go back as we try to bring this to a close. I want you to go. Oh, remember I said Ezekiel 48. Did I say Ezekiel 48? Look at that verse, verse 35. This, this is one amazing verse. It's just kind of interesting to think about this verse. The very last verse of the book of Ezekiel, it says this, 35. So 48, 35, it says this. It was round about 18,000 measures. Watch this. And the name of the city from that day shall be What? Why, why would you name the city that? Because that's where he's going to be from that day. J Jerusalem has, has never yet really been made known the joy of the whole earth. Even in the days of Solomon, as wonderf wonderful as it was, there was still some rebellion in the camp and some of the nations and so forth. Things are going to change. The best days ahead, the best days of this earth are yet future. Can't wait to hear Brother Rick's message tomorrow night about that in the kingdom. But you can see that the name of the city from that day shall be the Lord is there. I want you to get two more passages, uh, three passages, and then we're going to wrap this up. I, I, really and truly, okay? <laughs> Maybe. All right. Do this. Go with me to the book of Revelation 13. Go to Revelation 13. I'm going to have you get three passages. Revelation, uh, let me make sure I have the right one here. <clears throat> yeah, Revelation 13. Then you're also going to get John. You know what? I, okay, can, will you forgive me if I add one more? <laughs> really, 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 okay. Help, bear with me, please, okay? You, okay. You, you, you can learn never to trust grace preachers when they're preaching, right? You, okay, you, here's what you want to have. I'm going to have you get uh, uh, John chapter 19. We'll try to do this. I'm going to have you, so you got Revelation 13. You've got John chapter number 19. You can have Exodus chapter number, <coughs> pardon me, Exodus chapter 15. <coughs> and then we're going to go right back to where we started in Revelation 16. So you actually have those four passages. I'll, I'll give you a chance to get those. So you're going to have Revelation 13. Since you got Revelation 13, you're also going to get Revelation 16. Okay, so that's, but that was the four. That's those the four, right? I asked for one more, right? So you're going to have 13 and 16 Revelation. You're going to have John 19, and you're going to have Exodus, Exodus 15. Way back in Exodus, when, when God brought Israel out of Egypt and achieved that great victory over Pharaoh and his armies and, and thereby over Satan and the gods of Egypt. Moses in this song here gave the Lord a title. And it's in Exodus 15, 3. He says this. He declares him to be this. See that verse? The Lord is what? The Lord is a man of war. The, Jehovah is his name. That, that song right there was given, that, 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 epi, that, that title was given to the Lord because it was evidence of the fact that if you're going to engage 
the God of this earth, you're going to have to engage him as the Lord of war, the man of war. What did Pharaoh and his armies find out? What did Satan find out back here at Exodus when they attempt to do so? That you're not going to win. The Lord engaged Pharaoh and his armies, and back here, therefore, engaged the gods of Egypt and earned that, that right to wear that, that name. Well, it's interesting because that concept comes up again in Revelation. Only they attribute it to someone else. When you're in Revelation 13, when you're in Revelation chapter 13, this beast here, the Antichrist, remember he, he receives a deadly wound, but then he's healed. Remember that? And so the world, they wonder at him. In Revelation 13, 4, it says this, Revelation 13, 4, it says, And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, look at what they claim. Who is like unto the beast, look at the next one, who is able to make war with him? And in asking that question, they're actually making a statement, are they not? It's like a rhetorical question. They believe that this person is the rightful king of the earth. They believe that no one can conquer this person. They say, who is able to make war? Well, God in the book of Revelation, he enters his man into the contest. And his man is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we've seen verse after verse after verse tonight how the Lord Jesus Christ, he comes and he enjoins the battle and every single place where he takes on the adversary and the adversary's armors, he, uh, uh, armies, he defeats them utterly with a decisive, overpowering victory. And he arrives in Jerusalem as the great king. And he establishes his literal physical kingdom on this planet. Now get Revelation chapter number 19, uh, 16. Revelation chapter num num number 16 here. You remember we saw, we saw at the sixth vial was the thing that in relationship to our study tonight initiated this whole thing. The assembly of the armies of the, of, of, of the Antichrist to the place known as Armageddon. But then what happens, you can see at verse 17. Verse 17, it says this. And the seventh angel sounded. So this is that last, seventh angel poured, I read that wrong. The seventh angel poured out his vial. So here's the seventh vial into the air. Watch this now. And there came a voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne. Who's that? That's God the Father. What does he say? What's he say? He echoes something his son said about 2,000 years ago in John chapter number 19 when a previous wrath was poured out upon man's sin on Christ, his own son. The Lord Jesus Christ back there, he, he drank of the wine of the wrath of Almighty God. When, when he suffered our sins, the sins of humanity, past, present, and future, past, present, and future. And when the Lord Jesus Christ did that and it was done, he, it was done, he shouted, it is finished! He bows the head and gives up the ghost. And three days later, God the Father answered and raised him from the dead, agreeing with him. And then history has progressed to the point where like the sun said, it is finished. So now at this point in history, the father is going to say, it is done. My son who died for the sins of, of the world back there, the one to whom I gave all judgment, all right to judge, he now I have sent him back. His name is faithful and true. In righteousness he doth judge and make war. He's the one who has the right to judge, who has the right to make war. And you can see the echo of it is finished. It is done. If you get in the first, it is finished. You won't have to partake of the wrath of the last. It is done. You see that? Trust Christ and believe him. Trust what he did at Calvary years ago that the Apostle Paul preaches as the preaching of the cross, the best news ever. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you that we could spend some time this evening looking at some of these
some of the things that you, you disclose in your word, you tell us they're a good matter to you. When you are going to bring to pass the Lord Jesus Christ, the word, the true and faithful one, to return, to rescue your remnant, to set up your kingdom, your throne, and establish him as the King of kings and Lord of lords on this earth. God, we understand that, that we live in the dispensation of grace, and it's so wonderful to think about these things and know that the future is in your hand. And as has been said the other night by, by, by Pastor Ted here, that the future is still future. We're st we are still here today. And so you leave us here as your ambassadors to really convey to the world that the declaration of heaven to earth is not yet prepare war, but rather it is a message of grace and peace through the finished work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for this. In Christ's precious name, amen.